Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Whiskey Noobs Podcast. For those of you who are new here, my name is Chris and I am the host of the show. And today we have yet another Whiskey Frequently Asked Questions episode where I answer questions that you guys send to me on Instagram through my Instagram story and give you guys some answers to your questions. As I mentioned, I do receive these questions through Instagram. So you can submit your question if you have one through my Instagram story. Every Wednesday, I make a post that you can submit a question to, and I will then gather those up for a month. And once a month, I have the Q&A or FAQ episodes and answer your questions. Uh, The Instagram is at whiskey underscore noobs for those of you who don't know. And I do repeat most of this at the end of the episode. So normally I do have a mystery whiskey review on the episodes where I don't review a specific bottle, but today I'm not doing that for a very special reason. Today I'm actually drinking Blanton's, and the the story behind that is kind of cool, so I will mention it real quick. My friends actually all pitched in and got me a bottle of Blanton's because they know how much I like the Buffalo Trace Distillery, and they got it for me for the one-year anniversary of the Whiskey Noobs podcast. So shout out to my friends for getting me the bottle of Blanton's, which is awesome, and also shout out to Smokers Paradise and Liquor for actually having it in stock. So that's in Eurexville, Ohio. Um, It's a little far away for me to go there, but if you are in that area, then I recommend you go check them out because they actually had Blanton's in stock when my buddies. Uh, we're trying to find a bottle for me. So I thought that was pretty cool and figure I'd give them a shout out. Now, without further ado, let's get into the frequently asked questions. The first question that we have for this month is, which distillery has the best range, core or expanded? So the best range of products, this is the way I'm interpreting this uh, question. Which distillery has the best range of products, whether it be just their core products or also like expanded products like Not necessarily just their headliners, but also all the little offshoots that they do. There are a ton of answers to this question because when you ask for the best range, it's a little bit subjective. Everybody has a different opinion of, of what they want from a range. Like a good example I would say is maybe somebody only wants a good range of bourbons um, and they don't really care about, let's say, finished bourbons. And so the best range to them is going to be different than the best range to somebody else. But I'll just throw out a couple that I have, I guess I'd say, the most experience with that have good a, a good range to them. But this isn't necessarily going to be the best range on the market because it depends so heavily on what exactly you want from the distillery's range, what you're looking for. Um, I could say the obvious, and that's Buffalo Trace. A lot of you guys know that I love Buffalo Trace. And they do have a ton of products. They're one of the oldest distilleries in America. And um, their their product list just goes about forever. And a lot of them are very well-known products. But I'm guessing you probably don't want to hear me talk about Buffalo Trace any more than I already do. So I will mention, I like Old Forester. I feel like they have a really good lineup. And also they have budget options and more expensive options. And then with that, then this is where it gets really subjective. I like Four Roses. But I wouldn't say they have a range like a huge selection. I just like that if you get like the normal Four Roses, run-of-the-mill Four Roses, it's pretty good and really good in its price range. Um, But then also they have good ones in the higher price range. And if you've been listening for a while, you probably know that I'm a big fan of Four Roses Single Barrel and also their Small Batch and Small Batch Select. So they they don't have necessarily a ton of products. But I just think, I guess I would say if you're looking for the basics, but on multiple different shelf levels, I think they deliver pretty well for that as well. So like I said, Old Forester Four Roses, neither one of those necessarily have like this huge range and all of these different types that they create. Um, But I just think that they have good solid selections in multiple different price ranges. And I have good experience with those. Um, one last one that I'll mention just because I saw the bottle and thought, oh, I should have mentioned that is Wild Turkey. I think they have a decent range as well. Uh, you've got just like the base Wild Turkey, then you've got Long Branch, then you've got Rare Breed. They also make Russell's Reserve, if you don't know that, and all the Russell's Reserve offshoots that there are. So they have decent range as well. Um, but that's kind of a, like I said, that can be a subjective question. So hopefully the way that I answered it is what you are looking for. Uh, 
my answer probably if you were just to say like in your opinion like your favorite for for the amount of options they have i'd probably say buffalo trace but also it's so hard to get your hands on anything from buffalo trace that that might not necessarily be the case um so hopefully that answers that question for you Um, but if you want to send it again slightly more specific as i always say with any of these if i don't answer them the answer that you're looking for like the the way you intended the question to be read feel free to submit it again and i'll answer it again uh, the next question is, what is a good alternative to Eagle Rare? And my immediate reaction to this when I first read it, I'm not kidding, and people are going to be like, probably roll their eyes if you've been listening for a while, was Buffalo Trace. Uh, and the reason that I wanted to say that, though, is because I think Buffalo Trace is really close to being as good as Eagle Rare. Um, I, al- I actually consider it basically a matter of preference, whether you like Buffalo Trace or Eagle Rare more. And the reason I point that out is that Eagle Rare is more expensive. But you're asking for a good alternative, so I'm guessing you can't find Buffalo Trace products. And what I'll say to that is there could be a a bunch of good options. And I haven't tried Eagle Rare side-by-side with very much. So this actually spurred me with an idea that I think I should start doing probably some side-by-side tastings like on TikTok and on Instagram with Eagle Rare to try to come up with a good alternative to it. So I might do that. Um... Because like I said, I haven't sat with it enough to really think, oh, what would I replace this with? But what I will say is just off the top of my head, I guess what my gut feel was whenever I read this question was um, maybe Four Roses Single Barrel or Four Roses Small Batch. Those are both, I think the the single barrel is a bit more expensive than the small batch. is closer to Eagle Rare's retail price. Uh, the small batch select is way above the Eagle Rare's retail price, so that's why I wouldn't bring that into it. But I do like both of those, and they have a similar, especially with the uh, single barrel, which I have more experience with, they have a that good kind of almost ethanol punch with the flavor that I think, I you know, that I think Eagle Rare has personally. And then also I would say maybe, and this one's new for me, so this is a big maybe, but maybe the Middle West Spirits bourbon that I just reviewed not long ago on TikTok and on Instagram, it, I recall it having that same kind of, Eagle Rare to me has this characteristic of like alcohol punch with flavor, with sweetness, and that might sound really vague, but in my head it's a lot more specific than that. <laughs> um, it's just hard to articulate, but I would like to try both of those side by side with it, the Four Roses Single Barrel and the Middle West Spirits Bourbon. So I think I might be doing that. So keep an eye out for that uh, coming soon and maybe some other ones as well. Maybe that that folks comment or anything like that, that I'll be trying side by side with Eagle Rare to try to pin down what a good replacement is for it. Because I think that'd be a lot of fun. So that's kind of a half answer, but hopefully it is enough of an answer for you. And I guess I would say keep an eye on the TikTok page. Uh, My name is Chris from Whiskey Noobs on there uh, or at Whiskey Noobs Podcast. So keep an eye on the TikTok page. The next question is an easy one. How much does Cooper's Craft retail for and what part of the country are you in? I'm glad you threw that in there because I was going to have to mention anyways when you ask for a price. I got to tell you that I'm in Ohio, uh, so it's all state controlled liquor. Um. So for Cooper's Craft, I don't know if you mean just Cooper's Craft, like the base, or Cooper's Craft Barrel Reserve, because Cooper's Craft Barrel Reserve is what I've had on TikTok, and I think on Instagram as well. So I'll just tell you both. Cooper's Craft Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey, their run-of-the-mill normal bourbon, is $24, and I am in Ohio, so this is coming from OHLQ, which gives you the state liquor pricing, and the Cooper's Craft Barrel Reserve is $30. Now, I have had both, but it's been longer since I had the -the run-of-the-mill Cooper's Craft. And if I recall correctly, they're both good. But I think personally, and this is a total matter of opinion, just for $6, I think it's worth bumping up to the barrel reserve. Um, But I'd have to try the -the run-of-the-mill again to really compare the two. But I, I just... For me, six dollars. I don't consider that to be a whole lot um, in in the whiskey world. Six dollars isn't a huge price difference, and so I think it's worth it to bump up to that barrel reserve, which I think is a a pretty good budget bourbon in my opinion. I just took a sip of that Blanton's, which I won't be reviewing in this episode, but I might do a review episode on. I think that's something that would probably probably be worth doing because there's enough people out there hunting it that you should know what you're hunting. So I I might have a review episode for that coming up. So the next question, does whiskey change with temperature fluctuations, and there, there's a little twist to it, even if it has yet to be popped open? And that's a good distinction to make because once they're open, I think 
the resounding answer is absolutely. But I will argue that still closed, yes. I, I don't like to let my whiskey see very much temperature fluctuation. I keep my whiskey in my basement in a room that's usually dark uh, and gets very little natural light because I have so much of it that it sits on the shelf for so long that I really want it to, to hold up the test of time. So it's pretty important to me uh, that my whiskey stays at a relatively consistent temperature. Now, you could make the argument that once it's not opened, it's not as important, but I disagree because, and I've actually read online a couple of places, um, that it's still within that bottle making the whiskey evaporate a little bit and it can't escape the bottle. And so the downside of that is then you have this whiskey vapor essentially interacting with the cork potentially more than it should be. Uh, and you don't want that that cork interaction. You don't want to potentially rot out your corks. At the end of the day, if it depends on how long you're keeping your whiskey for. When you have as much of it as a lot of collectors do, I think it's always better to err on the side of caution. If you can keep your whiskey at a good temperature, do it. Now, that's not to say that if you drive somewhere, if you pick up whiskey at the liquor store and then park your car in the Walmart parking lot and then come home, it's going to be ruined. That's not necessarily what I mean. I've done that plenty of times and still enjoyed the bottle once I opened it. But what I do mean is when you're keeping it for a pretty long time, you're keeping it on a shelf, something like that, then I would really err on the side of caution. And then, of course, once it's opened and there's a good amount missing from it, you got to get more and more cautious as that level of whiskey goes down because it gets more and more temperamental, essentially, and it's going to start interacting with the air and you're going to have uh, problems. And this is something, too, I, I can just mention quickly that – I started taking more seriously uh, the more I got into whiskey. I think the first real moment where I started taking overall whiskey aging seriously, and when I say aging, I mean not the good kind where it's aging in a barrel, but the bad kind where, bad or good depending on the whiskey, where it's aging because you open the bottle and it's getting older now. Not necessarily better age, but older. Um, I think I started to take this seriously, actually, from the neck pour. If you've ever heard of a neck pour, a lot of folks argue that the first pour out of the bottle of whiskey is the worst because um, it's considered the neck pour. There's all these reasons behind it, but the the big thing is a lot of folks say that some whiskeys need to sit on a shelf for a little bit to start to taste better, which is the same principle, right? Either way, you're saying once you open it, the age is affecting it. And the first time I really started to take this seriously was with uh, Old Forester Bottled and Bond, I believe. and or, or it might just be Old Forester 100. It might not be bonded. But I got it, and so I had a bunch of people comment, you got to let it sit on your shelf a little bit. You got to let it sit on your shelf. You shouldn't be drinking it, or you shouldn't be reviewing it with just the first pour. And that time, I actually did notice a difference when I came back to it probably like, two or three weeks later, maybe a month later, I was like, oh, this actually tastes different to me. Maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe it was my palate condition. But my point out of all of that story is that sitting on a shelf once opened can have a pretty big impact on the flavor, in my opinion, or I guess could potentially. So all of that is to say that um, I think you need to always err on the side of the caution with your whiskey. If you're not purposefully opening it to let it set for uh, you know a month or, or whatever and interact with the air a little bit, if you're not purposefully doing that, then I always, always, always err on the side of caution. Try to keep it from getting too warm. Try to keep it from major temperature fluctuations. Keep it out of the sunlight, things like that, um, because you want it in the end. You're, you're investing in this bottle and you want it to last. The next question is a slightly more difficult one to answer, but I will talk about it. Um, do you know which bourbon whiskeys use natural burning fire to char the barrels? So I'm guessing you're alluding to burning wood in order to char the barrels. I don't know them off the top of my head. I'm sure I could do some research and maybe figure it out. But what I do know from looking on multiple distilleries' websites, whenever I'm looking up a bottle, trying to learn more about it, especially for the show... I do know that that's not something I see often is how we char our barrels or, yes, we use natural wood-burning fire to char our barrels. That's not something that I see often. And I would venture to say most probably don't. But 
like I said, that's kind of a guess. Um, a very quick Google search, I found that Lux Row Distillers does not, uh, if you are familiar with Rebel Bourbon or with Ezra Brooks, those are both Lux Row. And they mentioned on their website, they actually mentioned they do use propane to char their barrels. And I'm sure there are some out there that do it, and I'm sure they probably advertise it more than the others. And I'm sure somebody's going to say, how do you not know that these people do it? But Overall, I find that most distillers don't go too in depth into their process unless it's for an advertising point. So, like the only ones that would probably advertise how they char their barrels, except I guess Lux Row, because I just said they advertise they do propane. But my guess would be the only ones who advertise what they do to their barrels would be ones who have a reason to. They want to brag, oh, we use natural burning, you know, fire to uh, char our barrels. But that's a cool question and something that I feel like I'm going to keep an eye out for and be more aware of. But as I mentioned, <clears throat> it's not something that I have come in contact with or seen from researching any of the whiskeys for the show. So it it doesn't seem to me at first glance to be something that's very common, uh, but maybe I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, then hopefully somebody calls me out on it and I can issue a redaction in a later episode. But that is my answer to that. Okay, moving right along to the next question. Um, this one is another one where hopefully I'm answering this the way you want me to answer it, but if I'm not, then just let me know. The hill you're prepared to die on, defending your top bottle under $30. So I think the way that I read this is, if you have a top bottle that's under $30, what argument would I use to try to convince people that this is a good bottle for under $30? Like, what would my my main delivering point be in my argument I guess and here is my point <laughs> um, I would say my point with any bottle under $30 that I recommend to folks that I am absolutely willing to die on is it is the best bottle quote unquote for this hypothetical bottle under $30 I have had folks before, and actually you probably saw us a little bit in the episode with Justin, if you uh, were around for the Larceny episode with Justin, where he was a little bit disappointed. He's like, oh, I thought you said this was the best out of March Madness. And I said, yes, it was, but it was a budget bourbon March Madness. We are drinking whiskey that costs $30. I think Larceny, it might be like 31 or 32 but my point was, you have to manage your expectations. And so when I discuss budget whiskeys, not just bourbons, but whiskeys in general, I try to make that clear that I am saying this is a great bottle for the price. And some folks will say, oh, I didn't think this was good at all. And they drink higher dollar stuff the majority of the time. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's not as good as a $50 bottle of bourbon. I'm just saying it's really good for a $30 bottle. And Obviously, once you get into the higher dollar amounts, you can see a lot less fluctuation. So it wouldn't be crazy to assume that maybe a $50 bourbon will be better than like some $70 bourbons. But down in that $30 range, you're really eking out every bit of flavor that you can get underneath that range. So the hill that I'm willing to die on is manage your expectations for an under $30 bottle of whiskey because I can recommend to you my favorite that I pay less than $30 for. But that's not to say it's going to taste anywhere near as good as my favorite for $60 or something like that. Um, so hopefully that's the way you wanted me to answer that question. But that is the hill I'm willing to die on. Now, if your question is like, what top bottle under $30 am I willing to argue tooth and nail for? The answer would be a lot of them. Uh, I like a lot of sub $30 bourbons specifically because I like bourbon for, for beginners. Um, I like a lot of sub $30 bourbons for beginners because I think it's a good way to get your feet wet relatively cheap. So if I recommend a bourbon to somebody under $30, and there is some range there too, I want to make that clear. Uh, like for example, Larceny won over Old Granddad Bonded in my Budget Bourbon March Madness because it was a little bit more towards my palate. Um, but then actually I did have Justin try the Old Granddad and he liked that more. Um, and I think that was completely a matter of preference. So the hill that I'm willing to die on for any bottle under $30 that I would recommend to people is that they are awesome for getting your feet wet if you're newer and you're trying to figure out what you like and if if you will like whiskey, you're trying to learn to like whiskey. Sub-$30 bourbons are a great option for that. 
Okay, moving on to the next question. This person says, I'm new to bourbon, and there's so much hype around Buffalo Trace products. Are they really worth it? Yes and no. Um, Buffalo Trace products, I find that most of them that I encounter are worth retail price. And I say that as I'm drinking Blanton's right now. <laughs> um, I find that a lot of Buffalo Trace products are worth retail price or perhaps a bit more than what they retail for. Now this, and I, I'm saying this over the entire line of Buffalo Trace products, so obviously there are outliers in both directions. I think there are some that are overpriced, but I think there are a few, especially the ones that you see people going after, that are underpriced, and just by a little bit. But I think by doing that, they create a lot of hype around them, and they get really hard to get, and they don't put out very much volume, and so it's really hard to get, and that builds up a lot of hype. <clears throat> And I could go more in depth into this, but actually I did a whole episode on that. Um, episode 47, What's the Deal with Buffalo Trace? Uh, it goes into a bit more depth about how I feel about the Buffalo Trace distillery, how I try to put off that, yes, I absolutely love Buffalo Trace, but here's my reason why, and no, you should not pay $50 for a fifth of run-of-the-mill Buffalo Trace. So... That is, I, I feel like I carry a pretty balanced opinion, actually, and a lot of folks think that I'm just some, like, tater who just loves Buffalo Trace, <laughs> but I don't necessarily just fangirl over Buffalo Trace. I have specific reasons that I like it and specific reasons that I think it does get overhyped quite a bit. So there are upsides and downsides to it, I guess, is my my point. So go listen to that episode if you want a bit more in-depth of an opinion. Um, but that's a good question and one that I try to answer as often as I see it come up. The next question, uh, kind of going in that same vein of being over overly hyped, is what is the most overrated, quote unquote, good sought after whiskey in your opinion? So the way I read this is a whiskey that's highly sought after and is good, but is overrated. And ironically enough, my answer to this is all of the Buffalo Trace products. I love all of the Buffalo Trace products, but I do think they have a hype behind them that no whiskey could ever live up to. They have this extreme hype behind them that people think they're going to be this miracle whiskey. But you mentioned, you specifically put good in your question, and so my answer is, yeah, I like almost all of the Buffalo Trace products, but I do think that they get overly sought after. And not to just keep repeating myself, but actually going back to an early question, if I had to pick a specific one, I would say, in my opinion, Eagle Rare is a little bit... If I had to pick something out of the Buffalo Trace lineup, I love Eagle Rare, but I think it might be the most overrated in that I don't think it should cost more than Buffalo Trace. I think, as I mentioned, they're about equally good and just a matter of opinion as to which one you like more. I like them both, but I wouldn't pay too much more for Eagle Rare. I basically only pay as much as it costs just to have a bottle because I like Buffalo Trace's products and I like to collect them. I am, I do consider myself a collector, but there's a lot of negative energy around collectors online right now that there are these people who never open bottles. I do open and drink all of my bottles, <laughs> but I also am like a collector in the sense that I want to have them all. I want to try all of them. So my point is, uh, yeah, I do have Eagle Rare and I do pay what it costs, but I do think it's overrated. I think it's not this extremely better version of Buffalo Trace that folks sent, tend to think that it is. So that would probably be my answer because it checks all those boxes. It's highly sought after by a lot of folks. It is good, uh, but it is overrated for what it is, in my opinion. The next question is one that I ask myself every day. If you could drink only one whiskey for the rest of your life, what would it be? No, that's my answer. No. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, I would take it a step farther and say, am I still buying the whiskey? Like, am I still having to pay for it? So cost is a factor or is cost no factor at all? If cost is no factor at all, like, oh, it's the only whiskey I can drink for the rest of my life, but I get it for free. Um, then I don't have an answer yet. I don't think I've found that bottle yet that and I mentioned this before like the all-time best bottle I've ever had somebody asked and I said I don't think I've found it yet I haven't had a moment where I was like hands down by far without any other considerations this is the best bottle I've ever had in my life I haven't really had a bottle really hit me like that if cost is a factor I could go a few directions with this um 
but I really, really, and and the last episode actually reignited this for me. I really like Angel's Envy. Um, I like that it's different though. And so when you say the only whiskey I could drink for the rest of my life, I feel like I always fall in love with it when I come back to it because it's different from what I drink most of the time. So maybe Angel's Envy. Um, and I'm looking around at my shelf here to try to, to think of other ones. So maybe if we're going finished bourbon, Angel's Envy, if we're going just the general bourbon category, um, maybe like Four Roses Single Barrel because we are factoring in price. That's only 45 bucks, and I feel like it's a good drink for 45 bucks. Um, Irish, I'm going to say Red Breast 12. Love Red Breast 12, and it's also their cheapest one that I'm aware of. And Scotch, I'm going to say Glenfiddich because it's also right in that $40, $45 price range, but also really good for that price. Um, so those are just completely off the cuff. Somebody's going to say, well, don't you like this one better? And I'm going to say, yeah, I do, but I'm just coming up with this off the top of my head. <laughs> so if those were, if I had to pick one from any one of those categories, those would probably be my answers. Okay, moving on to the next question. How did I get into whiskey? I actually do have a full episode about this, which n- the episode number I did not look up, so I'm going to try to do that as I answer the question. Uh, but the general answer, the quick answer is I was into cigars and cigars got me into whiskey. Um, I was into cigars and I'm from Ohio, so it's difficult to uh, have cigars year round because it's so cold outside. And so then I started getting into pairing whiskey with cigars and I started to think I can drink whiskey all year round. And so then I kind of got into whiskey from there. And in episode number 43, my whiskey journey so far, I do go more in depth into that and really talk about parts where I got hung up and where I think, um, my podcast is trying to help people who could get hung up in those same parts. So that does go a bit more in depth into it. But overall, uh, whiskey and cigars both I got into because of my dad. Um, he smokes cigars and drinks whiskey. Uh, and so it's one of those things we always just bonded over and we've always done together a- as I became of legal age. I shouldn't say always, <laughs> not when I wasn't of legal age. Um, but once I was of legal age, it's something that we've always talked about and you know just done together so he's the one who really got me into it it's one of those things you see dad smoking a cigar and drinking a glass of whiskey and you think that looks like he's enjoying that quite a bit so I want to I want to see what all the hype's about and it stuck and I did get into it Uh, and so that is how I got into whiskey so once again episode 43 goes a bit more in depth but that's the quick answer to it Uh, The next question, which is actually perfect for going right behind what made you get into whiskey, what made you want to start an Instagram to share your love of whiskey? Um, So for this person, I do want to mention, actually, that I didn't start off by having an Instagram. I started off by having a podcast, this podcast, actually. And the Instagram technically released before the podcast, but the Instagram only came about because of the podcast. So I wanted to make a whiskey podcast, and I thought, well... I'm going to need an Instagram to help advertise and help connect with people and give my listeners somewhere to see me and see uh, what I'm doing. Eventually, that evolved into making reels, and that was because I got on TikTok, and then I started really liking that type of content because you can do long-form content and reviews and things that actually bring some really good value. And you can also just do comedy, which I've always loved comedy. I'm a big fan of comedy-type movies, comedy TV shows. I've always been into that, never good enough to be like stand-up or anything. But then I thought, well, I can get into comedy as well. And so that is kind of why the Instagram evolved into what it is. Um, But to kind of answer the root of your question, I think knowing this knowledge now that the podcast is the reason for the Instagram, you might ask, what made you want to start a whiskey podcast? And my answer to that would be that I wanted to listen to a whiskey podcast and there weren't really any out that were serving the purpose that I wanted. Um, they weren't really the, what I wanted in a whiskey podcast. And so I thought, well, I could make that. (laughs) And so that's exactly what I did. Um, I, had already had some experience with how to podcast and how to produce it if I wanted to. And I thought, let's just go for it. Um, and that's, that's how I got to where I am today. And so that is essentially the reason for it was I wanted to listen to a podcast. There wasn't one that was itching the scratch for me. And so I thought, well, I will just make it. Um, so hopefully that answers that question for you. Uh, The next question is a a simple one. What color are your socks today? Uh, Today, my socks are black, which they are just about each and every day. 
Um, so that answers that, I suppose. <laughs> Moving on to the next question. When creating a whiskey, are notes planned or luck? Yes, that's my answer to this. Uh, notes are planned to an extent, um, and I think any I think if you were to ask any distiller, they would probably say, yeah, we, we do this to get this flavor and this to get this flavor, and you throw this much rye in to get this much spice, and you throw this much wheat in to get this much sweetness. And as you try different whiskeys, you'll recognize these patterns, and you'll see how if somebody was a professional, they could piece together a pretty darn good whiskey um, based on the experience that you have knowing that you're not a professional. That's at least my experience is I'm not a professional. I've just tasted a bunch of whiskeys and I'm like, I think I could piece together a pretty good mash bill. But the reason I say yes and no is a lot plays into it aside from the mash bill. Um, There's a lot that goes into the flavors all the way down to just the geometry of the still that they're distilling it in. And so I do think the best distillers have a really good idea of how they want to craft a whiskey to taste a certain way. But I also think a lot of it is either luck, trial and error, or I guess to sum it all up into a phrase, it's more of an art form than it is a science at this moment in time, in my personal opinion. Um, I think a distiller might tell you, yeah, I know exactly what this is going to taste like if I make it this way. And I I think they're lying a little bit. I I don't think anybody in this moment knows exactly what their whiskey is going to taste like um, once they ev- eventually make it. Um, but I'm 100% certain that some amount of planning goes into it and they don't just say, well, let's throw all these ingredients together and see what happens. Although I'm sure that does happen sometimes. And then you get things like Makers 46 where they're like, oh, let's just see what happens if we age all these whiskeys, all these bourbons with different charred staves in it um and that's a really bad uh summary of what they did there's a bit more in depth to it than that but that's essentially where it came from so some of it's trial and error some of it is experience for sure the next question you mentioned that you are a christian do you get any shade for drinking alcohol um this is a good one uh because i think it brings up a good point about christianity i don't want to sound like i'm bible thumping at all um i just want to say my personal experience i find that a lot of christians that i agree with theologically that i agree with about the big important stuff don't see drinking as problematic i think the vast majority of christians see excessive drunkenness as problematic and it it seems pretty clear to me that that is problematic um but I don't think having a glass of whiskey for the purpose of observing it, like I try to promote on this podcast, is seen as negative to a lot. Now, to answer your initial question, though, yes, I have come in contact with Christians who think that's disgusting that you're even into that. I can't believe you know, you're know you that into alcohol. You call yourself a Christian, whatever. Uh, they haven't specifically said that to my face, but it has been alluded to <laughs> before. Um, and to them, I say, I'm sorry that we disagree. But one thing that I will say, and this is actually something that my my pastor said in one of the first uh, times that I went to service at this church that I go to now, and he said, you know, there are so many different things you can disagree on theologically and how you practice Christianity and things like that. Um, But all that really matters to me is that we agree that Jesus is the Lord, essentially. And he had a whole sermon about it or a whole service about it. that was really good. And I'm probably butchering it right now, but I basically take that stance as well. Um, I might be what some people consider a more relaxed Christian if you don't know very many Christians. But I think if you do know a lot of practicing Christians, I'm actually either run of the mill, if not a little bit more strict than a lot of them, because I, well, I don't want to get too too deep into all of the things I believe, but this could be a great conversation probably. But especially specifically for alcohol, I don't see any problem with drinking. I don't see much of a problem. This is just completely personal. I am not a pastor. I don't see any problem with a little bit of buzz, a little bit of the good feeling, the loosening up that alcohol gives you. But along with what I would consider most Christians, I do see a problem with excessive drunkenness to the point of like belligerence. Um, Hopefully that wasn't too Bible thumpy for those of you who don't want to hear about my faith, but I am a Christian and I will talk about it and I will be more than happy to answer any, any questions that anybody has about my faith um, because I think it's important to get that message out there. And that's also why I mentioned that I was a Christian in, in the one is that I think it's important for folks to know like, yeah, I, I collect whiskey and I'm also a practicing Christian who goes to church 
almost every Sunday. Um, and I'm not what most people would think when they hear that. That's not the type of person I am or the personality that I have. So I just, I think it's important to get that point across. At any rate, I will get off my soapbox and just say that I have gotten slight shade from folks before. I just let it roll off my back. I've been judged a whole lot worse for a whole lot less in my life. Uh, and so I, it doesn't really bother me. But I am in contact, obviously, with a lot of Christians because I'm a Christian, and most of them don't have any problem with the fact that I collect whiskey and, and drink whiskey. So that's a very long answer, but it's a very important question to me personally. Um, for those of you who just got done hitting the 15-second skip button because you don't want to hear about my faith, I think it's a really good conversation to have, so maybe stop hitting that button. But also, I will move on to the next question and get off my soapbox. So, the next question is, my favorite non-whiskey liquor. This is a tough one. Um, I'm going to, I have been asked this before. I was asked my favorite clear spirits. Um, So, I'll say my favorite non-whiskey liquor is probably tequila. I really enjoy tequila because I find it very similar to whiskey in that there are different ways of aging it, different ages to it, and I think they all give it different characteristics and it can be fun to sit down and enjoy and taste. I also really like amaretto, but nowadays it's too sweet for me, or amaretto, however people pronounce it. You know I can't pronounce words if you have been listening for a while. Um, I also really like that, but nowadays it's a bit too sweet for me with the amount of whiskey that I tend to drink. Um, so I've kind of gone away from that and, uh, towards tequila, which I, I really like tequila because it's so unique personally. Uh, and I think I mentioned before, I haven't really gotten into gin, but I'd like to try it again. Cause the first time I tried it, it tasted like liquid pine needles. And so I, uh, I, I would like to try it again and give it a fair shake. I feel like, uh, two more questions left. So the next one is a really easy one. What is my unicorn? And I have a couple. Um, I think I've mentioned before, E.H. Taylor is kind of my current quote-unquote unicorn. It's what I'm currently trying to hunt down, any of the E.H. Taylors. Um, I also would really like some George T. Stagg, um, but that one seems even harder to get than than E.H. Taylor. Um, So both of them are from the Buffalo Trace Distillery. Another one that's not a unicorn for a lot of people is Early Times Bottled and Bond. But I can't seem to find it anywhere near me because uh, it is pretty popular. And But other people online have made it sound like they can get it pretty easily. So that's one that I'm going to check for as I'm going through different states and traveling and whatnot. Um, whenever, you know, just whenever I travel. I'm not taking some massive trip. I just realized it sounded like I'm going to venture through the United States. And I'm not. Uh, but anytime I travel, it's one of those ones that I'm going to start looking for now that I'm more aware of it and hunting it a bit more. But uh, I have a lot of unicorns. I could go on for hours probably about all the ones that I'd like to try, but off the top of my head, I like uh, I, I want to try E.H. Taylor. Or I, I've tried it. I like to have my own bottle of E.H. Taylor, and I want to try George T. Stagg, which I have not tried. Okay, last but certainly not least, which would you pick if they were free? William LaRue, Weller, or Pappy 15? I have two answers to this question, and they're completely opposite, so I have no idea which one it is. I'd have to really, really think on this. I would say William LaRue Weller because it is less overhyped than Pappy. And also I I think that's something cool about it is it could be a conversation piece because of that. And for the exact opposite reason, I would say Pappy because people know about it and it would be cool to show folks and cool to let my friends try because they've heard of it and they'd be excited about it. And they probably wouldn't be very excited about the W.L. Weller, uh, but which actually the William LaRue Weller, which is a specific type. um, But there is also W.L. Weller, all named after the same guy. I think it'd be cool to have both of them for both of those reasons. For personal reasons, William LaRue Weller, because it's a little bit different, it'd be cool to have. Um, And then for the folks around me, Pappy 15, because they would be so excited to try it, most likely. Um, And so that kind of, like I said, two completely opposite reasons, but both still pretty valid reasons, in my opinion. So that's all I've got for the questions today. Thank you so much to everybody who submitted them. Um, I always mention that I love doing these episodes. I love answering the questions that you guys specifically have for me. 
I think it's a blast to actually be able to see exactly what you guys want to hear. So if you have a question for me, please, as I always mention, submit it on my Instagram on Wednesday. I post a sticker on my story that you can type in any question to and just hit submit. I'm the only one who sees them, and then I will answer them on the show. That Instagram is at whiskey underscore noobs, which my robotic robotic disembodied voice is about to tell you at the end of this episode. Thank you so much to everybody who submitted a question, but that's all the questions that I have for today. So I will leave you with learn to drink, drink to learn. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Whiskey Noobs. If you like the show, please make sure that you tell anyone you know who you think would be interested in the hobby or in the podcast. That way we can help to spread the word and continue to grow. Please also make sure to review the show on Apple Podcasts and share our posts on Instagram at whiskey underscore noobs or on TikTok at whiskey noobs podcast. Uh, it only takes a couple of minutes and it really does a lot to help spread the word and grow the podcast. Also, there is an email list for the show. If you'd like to join, you can just send an email to whiskey noobs podcast at gmail.com and in the subject line put email list. I will add you to the list and then you'll be updated every month with the whiskeys that we will be drinking on the show throughout the month. That way you can drink right along with us and see if you're getting the same notes. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the show. The Whiskey Noobs podcast does not support underage or otherwise irresponsible consumption of alcohol.